so there's haptics, there's vibration going on here. So uh, we're here at Novacentis, and who are you? I am uh, Francois Janot. I am the CEO of uh, Novacentis since about a year ago when we restarted the company with a new market focus on uh, wearables technology. So here's, uh, this is potentially going as a, uh, and the whole wristband of a smartwatch? Yes. So what we do is we replace those kind of vibrators, those kind of actuators, which are uh, motors with an eccentric mass. And when the mass yeah. rotates at a specific frequency, the system enters in resonant mode and starts to vibrate. Yeah. So people use that to vibrate phones and uh, the silent mode on the phone is using those kind of motors that vibrate the full device. We replace this actuator with a film-based solution. This is uh, yeah. one of our actuators. So it's made as a, from a polymer and this polymer has some piezoelectric properties. When you apply an electrical field, the polymer extends if you yeah. attach it to a substrate... Can you put it on your hand like this? Yep. So that there... So it's very thin, compact. Very thin. It's like a piece of paper. It's very thin, very flexible. And when and you apply uh, an a bunch of these, field, You can have a bunch of these on a, on a strap. Is that what you do? Yeah. So you have four there? You that first. So yeah. what's happening is that when you apply different electrical voltage, yeah. the actuator can vibrate the surface of okay. the product that it's attached to. So you see here we can vibrate very slowly, a few hertz. So we can vibrate it at a very high frequency as well. We can even vibrate it in the audio range. So this can be a speaker and make 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 some sound. Oh. Which you cannot do with a normal uh, vi vibrator. Yeah, the only sound you get is zzz that most people can kind of find very annoying. So how how fast can it vibrate? It can go up to the uh, kilohertz range. Kilohertz. So very, very fast. Thousands per second. Thousands per second. All right. And there on this uh, So what strap? we do, our solution is re really ideal to vibrate locally straps and other device that you want on you, so any kind of wearable device. In this particular, particular example, we've embedded four different actuators directly inside the wristband of the device. So it's very flexible. How is it flexible? Well, it's very, everything it, is flexible it, in there? Everything is flexible, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a film, so, so everything is very flexible. And the idea is to have it embedded directly inside the wristband and vibrate the, the wristband in different locations. So nice. we can not only create different effects on each of the uh, actuators, so very slow vibration or very fast vibration, but we can also create patterns by actuating on one side or the other side. So then it's very easy for a user to feel different sensation and associate different sensation for different type of notification. This could be uh, gigantic with the patterns. You can feel your mom is calling. You don't yep. need to take the phone out. Exactly. You can feel very the good, boss. Very good use case. It's like the alarm is yes. different. Or, or many of those wearable devices have sensors like heart rate monitor. And if you want to run at a specific pace, the heart rate monitor is going to tell you that you are not running fast enough. And you could feel the vibration maybe on the left side of your wrist that tells you run faster. Or if you are not running fast enough or sl too slow, or not fast enough, the other way around basically. Does it help to uh, strap the, the wrist strap uh, tighter and then you, 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 you can feel things more precisely? Or uh, uh, how, how is it going to be? So some... And uh, how about this? Does it vibrate in that part too? Uh, yeah, so let's see if you can see that. It's, uh, again, you need to really feel it to get a sense of yeah. what we are talking about. But let's, uh, I think you can probably, can you, see, you can see it moving here. Yeah. What moves is really the actuator inside the wristband. And that creates a local vibration just on top of the actuator. So it's so very... So in this area, how many can you have? Can you have four or four can you would have... Four not be that useful. I think one is probably enough. Yeah. But the idea is to have one here, one here and one there, for instance. And then right. when you when you have it on your on your wrist, you and you can get feel, used to it, you can get used to it, and you can feel and learn the different vibration, and associate the different vibration to different type of notification. This is awesome. So, uh, what's the what's the cost and what's the power con con compared to a right. traditional uh, power power consumption is very similar to those device. Yeah, uh, the power consumption is not really. The power budget for those kind of uh, devices is not very big compared to the 
to the screen, to the wireless communication, to yeah. some other sensors are much more power. Less than 1% or something. So in that case, notification, you need uh, 30 to 50 notifications per day. So we are not talking about a, a big amount of power. Can it be sun-powered on a solar-powered smartwatch? I mean, it doesn't uh, use again, so much power, right? Yeah, it doesn't use a lot of power. It uses much less power than the screen, for instance. The Bluetooth 4 is going to use something, and then there's an e-ink watch, and then your haptics. It'd be awesome if it could be solar-powered. It could be awesome if it could be solar-powered, yes. But again, we, d we are not really the main power driver for those, yeah. those kind of devices. Uh, other sensors are much more power-hungry than what we do. So how far are you from mass production? So what's the next step? So what are you going to do now? So we started the company at the beginning of the year with a new management team, a new uh, market focus, and we also changed the manufacturing strategy. We are now looking at using manufacturing partners to make our product. So we're the, in the process of transferring our technology to our manufacturing partners. One of them is uh, Kemet, who is a manufacturer of a film-based capacitor. They use the same kind of process to make capacitors that we need to do to make our uh, actuators. We expect that uh, they will be in mass volume production towards the end of 2016. So we are still like 9 to 12 months away before we are in full, full, uh, full production. All right. So uh, any of the uh, device makers should just start contacting you and, yep. and putting this stuff in, in their devices? Yep, that's, Anybody? Uh, well, today we can, uh, we can make actuators in our lab in low volume. That's an example of our actuators made, made in our lab. So we can today support uh, OEMs and customers so that they can make uh, prototypes with our technology. So yes, we are ready to support customers today with, again, uh, the, the capability to be in mass volume production around end of 2016. So when you see one of those small, what do you call one of those? We call that an actuator. And one actuator. Is one there actuator. a specific size for it and a specific uh, power that can, yeah, like, we uh, can how much does it vibrate? We can make, so the, the size depend, is directly linked to the strength of the actuator. So a bigger actuator will have a bigger strength. So you can uh, uh, vibrate the larger surface. Uh, but a larger actuator is also uh, requires more power on the electronic side. So the, the, the size you just saw, 10, centimeter, 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, is a kind of a good size for a wearable device. But we, could make in, we can make them in any kind of size. Nice. So are you already talking with everybody? We are talking to many OEMs. Uh, everybody is really interested in creating better use, uh, notification system. We are talking to few OEMs that are building prototypes with our technology. And again, with uh, with the plan to be in in, uh, in uh, out with the first product towards the end of 2016. All right. I hope you're speaking with the Swiss watch guys. Uh, I want to see this in the Swiss watch. Yeah, they, they you have a classical us. watch, but you can feel stuff in it. That'd be awesome. Yeah. So, so maybe so an adapter that goes with every watch. So uh, the, the, the strategy of the company is not to make finished product at the moment. So so we love to work with people who are making actuator. I mean, who are making accessory to existing. Existing uh, standard size, uh, uh, what's it called, watch band. Yep. Then it can go with any watch. Yeah, is that so possible? I mean, Mont Blanc, I think, is doing uh, this uh, yeah? with uh, maybe a uh, large semiconductor vendor. So, so we are talking to some companies that are looking at those type of applications, so retrofitting or uh, upgrading existing watch with some s smart electronics in order to provide additional functionality. I really hope Swatch contacts you and then use the e-ink and then goes with Bluetooth 4 and just makes it work. Yes. And two months battery or more are unlimited with, with solar. That would be great. Okay. Differentiate very easily one effect from another one, the sensation from another one, and associate those different sensations to different type of notification. Being able to make sound is also very interesting because any kind of sensation that we get through our, our tactile sense uh, the combination of type of sensation but also sound. So when I touch something, it's, 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 uh, it's giving me a specific sensation through my fingers, but the sound also is very different. So this is very different than this. So the combination of sound and touch is, is something that is really help, helpful for the brain to, to understand things. So we are capable of not only creating type of sensation, but also sound and combine both of them, which will again help a lot the end user to understand and recognize different kinds of sensations, different kinds of feelings, and associate them to specific uh, information. So we can do that with one actuator, 
But another thing we can do is put two actuators, and they are thin and flexible, so the ideal solution for us is to put them directly inside the surface of the device. Uh, the limitation of our technology is that we don't have enough strength to vibrate a full device. So we could not vibrate a phone, we could not vibrate even a, a, a smartwatch. But we are really good at vibrating locally surfaces that are flexible. So the ideal uh, product for us is a flexible product that is close to your skin, that is conformable, which is basically how wearable devices are designed. So, so, so we have the capability to, to embed multiple actuators directly into the surface of the device so that we can create different effects for each actuator, but we can also create different patterns by activating each, each of those actuators independently. The brain is designed, is, is very good at detecting different patterns. Uh, good example of that is, uh, and so the brain is not very good at detecting things that are always the same. Uh, a, good, a good example of uh, thinking about that is, uh, if you look a picture of what your, see, your eyes see, we all have a big noise in the middle of the picture. But when we look at things, we don't see our noise anymore because the brain eliminates this information because it's not very useful. So the brain is very good at eliminating those kind of things. Uh, which means that when you always have a kind of a buzzing sound and you don't really kind of uh, uh, feel it, it's because the brain eliminates it as a non-useful information. That's why most people say, hey, I didn't, I didn't feel the sound more than you on my phone. Uh, I, or sometimes they, they feel it, but it's not happening. So the brain has some problems to kind of distinguish always the same constant kind of information. But it's very good at detecting patterns, left, right, right, left, those kind of things are very easy for the brain to pick up. So the big two advantages is creating different effects on each actuator and also creating patterns by using multiple actuators to, to provide information. So the, the, the case of the directional information, you can imagine that you can sense uh, a vibration on the left to tell, to tell you that you need to take a left turn or right to take a right turn. That's an easy example, but we, with this capability of creating different patterns, we can really help the user understand uh, a lot more information uh, without having to look at the device. So there is, I mean, the, there is a definite trend towards making those devices more, uh, I mean, even the, the Apple Watch is kind of bulky. Uh, and it's bulky because it's you, people want to make too many, too many things inside. So there is a definite trend towards trying to leverage the dead space inside the wristband and put some electronics. People want to put, I mean, it's been done before, uh, it's been done already, Microsoft puts a lot of electronics into their, into their band. They have flexible batteries, they have the heart rate monitor on the opposite side of the main device. So there is a clear trend towards adding more functionality into this wristband and we fit perfectly into within these trends because we have one additional components that will be embedded directly into the wristband to again provide better, better user experience. Today where all devices are uh, companion devices to cell phone, uh, but one thing that we, people are starting to say is nobody really likes the phone because it's big. We, having a big phone is super convenient. Put it in the pocket, put it in the purse, we need a big phone because we want to have a big display. But if we, if we start to look at technology such as flexible displays or the capability to project anything you have on one device into a different screen, then people start to think about, okay, maybe we don't need such a large phone all the time. Maybe we can have a smaller device that we want on us, like a smaller wearable device, and when we need a bigger display, we can do something else. So if that happens, when that happens, then phones would be very, very different. And although today we cannot vibrate a full phone, once the phone is kind of a wearable device, then our solution will be quite, uh, quite useful to create this better user experience around haptics. And uh, my last slide, uh, maybe some of you have seen that before, but it's kind of interesting. This, uh, this, uh, this guy uh, had looked at uh, the capabilities on the, on the iPhone in 2007 2009. And it's basically equivalent to, I don't know how many units,
is a device that you have a micro I mean, all, all those devices basically worth about $3,000 in uh, 1991 can be replaced with an iPhone. So that's pretty amazing to think about that. So to, and, and that's not going to stop. I have no idea how the phone will look like, but it's, uh, it's clearly uh, an example of how much innovation can happen. And I don't think that the phone we know it, uh, today will survive, because again, I don't think anybody likes a big phone. And we only, we only need a big phone because it, is, uh, it, it has a big screen. But I'm pretty sure that somehow the phone will change and uh, it's very possible that the phone will be some, some kind of a smaller device that we wear on, 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 on a, sort of a wearable device, uh, which will open even more opportunity for us. And that's about it. Happy to take any question. We also have a booth over there if you want to. Uh, the challenge about technology is that if you don't feel it, it's like, uh, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> We cannot really show anything, but I would like some of you, some of the faces here, and uh, everybody that's touching it and feeling it is, is really kind of, uh, oh, this is pretty cool. So I invite you to stop by your booth and try it out. I have, I have a question. Uh, uh, you said 200 volts. Um, that's pretty challenging, I think, in a wearable, and that, but there was no current uh, listed on that slide. So the power consumption and how to generate that voltage is the first question. The second one, uh, you said the Apple um, Watch actuator was three dollars and fifty cents. What would this one cost? All right, good, two good questions. So yes, yeah, so, so the, uh, the 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 technology is a piezoelectric effect. So piezoelectric requires high voltage. Uh, the, the the previous uh, uh, solution that the sensor that compress when you put some voltage, you can actually require three thousand volts to actually do something like this. We are at 212 volt, which is pretty high. It's not unusual for consumer electronic products to have to operate at high voltage. The current is very low. So in terms of power consumption, we are about the same, a little bit better than ERN, so the eccentric rotating mass uh, motors, but not significantly. So we don't have a huge power advantage, power consumption advantage, but we don't have a high either. Uh, power consumption also for notification is not a huge part of the overall power budget of those devices. So typically you, you have 30 to 50 notifications per day. So the overall power budget is relatively small compared to the display or other other type of sensors. Uh, so high voltage, but not uh, not not a, not a big issue on, in terms of power consumption. We are working with the microchip today that has designed a custom solution for our traders. And uh, again, it's it's uh, they have a full business unit working on high voltage components. So it's kind of surprising when you're the first time you, you hear it, but again, it's pretty, uh, it's not unusual to have high voltage components into consumer electronics. You do need to follow some specific guidelines when you design your board, you need in particular to have some space, some sufficient space between low voltage components and high voltage components, but all of this can be, uh, can be done fairly easily. In terms of costs, we are film-based uh, systems, so, so we are working on uh, with uh, manufacturing partners that are uh, using world-to-world processes to make our product, and uh, we are in particular working with Kemet, who is uh, kind of the, uh, doing the largest part of the uh, of the uh, of our manufacturing process. Kemet is a company based in the U.S. that is a leader in the film-based capacitors. So film-based uh, film capacitors are basically made exactly the same way that you make an actuator. So you take a film, you uh, metalize the film, and then you stack up multiple layers. In our case, we were talking about 30 to 50 layers. In a typical capacitor, it's hundreds of layers. So they have very efficient machines to make those products uh, in a, with very high throughput. Some of their part numbers are so cheap that they sell it by the weight. We are talking about capaci capacitors, so high, highly commoditized products. So we have the potential to make our product with them at a very low cost. So right now, when we are engaging with the potential customers, we are talking about the price per actuator at about 50 cents. But with volume, we'll be able to make our product at a much, uh, much, uh, much lower cost.